Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 10th meeting of 2018. I have apologies from Marie Goujon, MSP. Agenda item one is a decision on taking item six in private, which is consideration of our approach to scrutiny of the fire and rescue services. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is a, um, an evidence session on remand, our fourth this year. The main focus today is on the experience of prisoners on remand whether anything useful can be done in the remand period and the negative effects of remand on both prisoners and their families. I refer members to paper one, which is note by the clerk, and paper two, which is private paper. And I now welcome our witnesses this morning, Mary Cairns of Crossreach, who is manager of the Family Visitor Centre HMN, HMP Young Offenders Institute at Pomont. Neil Clark, Project Coordinator, HMP Kilmarnock, Mental Health Advocacy Service representing East Ayrshire Advocacy Services. Elaine Stocker, Deputy Chief Executive, Fam Families Outside. And Colin McConnell, Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service. And can I thank you all for your written submissions. They were really helpful to the committee um, prior to our evidence session. And can I thank Mary Cairns in particular for making yourself available this morning at very short notice. We really appreciate that. And we move straight to questions, starting with Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, can I just start with a sort of general question about the impact that uh, remand has on prisoners um, during the time in remand and then after release, if we could just start with a fairly general summary of that. We'd like to start. Whoever would like to start. Looks like you're smiling. <laughs> we'll start with you. Neil, would you like to? Yes, the, the impact we, um, the people we support encounter um, as I said in the written submission, we tend, the people we support, we tend to get the referrals once they're in custody. It's very rare that we are supporting someone in the community and we're in court when they're remanded. So the vast majority of the people we support, the referral comes once they're in custody. Um, the impact, as we've said in the written submission, it's only mental health we deal with. So the only people we work with um, have some sort of mental health issue. Um, the impact can range from when they're taken into custody, medication can be removed, so they can experience a delay in receiving medication, which has, can have quite a negative impact on their mental health. Um, so many people have been on certain mental health medication for a number of years, but for whatever reason in the prison, that medication is not available. There might be security concerns. Um, maybe there's a risk they'll be bullied for the medication. Um, there's a lot of concerns from prison management and healthcare, but it can have quite a, a negative impact on the people who have a genuine need for that medication. Um, other impacts can be just the uncertainty of knowing what's happening, particularly if it's the first time in custody. So we try and get the referrals as early as we can, which isn't always as straightforward as it should be, perhaps. Um, so our job then would be to maybe facilitate communication with family members, with um, legal representatives to make sure the support is in place for, for the people we're working with. Um, I think that's the kind of main impact uh -huh. we deal with, mm -hmm. certainly. Can I just ask the point you made about the medication? How is that monitored? You know, you, you're obviously saying that that happens. And what sort of time elapses before things get back at an even keel, or does, do they ever get back at an even keel? It, it varies for the people that have kind of regular contact with the healthcare department or with the mental health team. It can be relatively quick. So when they go in on reception, they might be told that medication won't be available, but they should get a GP appointment relatively quickly mm -hmm. and that can put things in place. Um, for some people, you know, if there's been an issue with prescriptions or you know, if there's been issues in the community, they'll have to wait for a mental health assessment for psychiatric input, which can take a period of time. Um, I think probably more a resource issue from the healthcare side. The NHS would be able to speak to this more than me, certainly. Mm -hmm. But for some of the people we have worked with, um, while they're on remand, it's, it's basically a case of we'll wait and see. We'll wait until the person's been back to court. Um, when I've raised that with healthcare, it's certainly been, you know, there's there's maybe a concern that they don't want to set up a, a treatment plan if someone's only going to be there for a couple of weeks when 
they might not follow that treatment plan if they're going back to the community. However, there are people we've worked with have been on remand for a number of months and have gone with no medication or no treatment where they have done in the, part, in the community. So there's definitely a gap in the kind of provision for people on remand. That's, that's interesting. I'm sure we'll want to follow that up mm. as, as we go on. Does anybody else like to comment about the impact? It's one of the concerns that families outside here on a regular basis, from the family's perspective, that they have concerns about someone going into prison, whether that's a custodial, a longer term custodial service or a shorter remand, that they have no access to support for, they're not able to support their relative in prison. They're worried about medication and the stress that that puts on them as family members can be compounded by not knowing what's going on. Um, it's an ongoing issue. Mm -hmm. We know that the families face very similar um, issues as to those with longer sentences when they are on remand. Mm. And it is about the fear of the unknown, what's going to happen, how long is that going to be? So the uncertainty of what is happening in their life for a very, what can be a short period of time, can be a real issue. We have a national helpline that takes calls from family members as well as professionals. Um, and initially we can be the first point of contact for families knowing that their, their relative is has gone to prison. What happens? How do you visit? How do you tell your children? What's the next point? How do you get the medication in? What about housing, etc.? So there are a whole range of issues, not least medical. So, so do you think the, the communication between the prison service and families um, is lacking? It sounds like it could be improved. I think it's, it's improved over the years. I think the prison service are doing an awful lot to engage with families at different times of the process, I think remand is particularly difficult. You know, it's a very short time. It can be a very short time in prison. And by the time, I suppose, the person in prison is um, back to court, then they're, they're out again. It doesn't, there isn't enough time to do anything with people who are on remand um, for families to find out, for families to start engaging. That usually happens when a custodial sentence is given. Okay. Mr McConnell? Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to comment on that. Uh, um, I'm conscious that you know, the committee's already um, had a number of views and evidence, uh, so I don't want to uh, go back over that. But <clears throat> just responding to some of the concerns that have been expressed, I think it's important to remember that uh, in terms of an individual's medical care, and particularly prescription drugs, I mean, these are issues for qualified uh, medical people to, to deal with. And as the committee already knows, uh, everyone uh, on reception, whether on conviction or in, in fact on reception uh, for remand, uh, everyone sees a, a nurse, qualified nurse uh, on reception uh, and will see a, a doctor within at least uh, 24 hours. So, um, uh, you know, I, I've, I've heard the concerns that, that colleagues uh, and stakeholders are expressing and I've heard those those concerns myself, but I think it would be important uh, for the committee to hear from the medical profession, uh, particularly those that are uh, working in prisons and dealing with um, the many difficulties and the many challenges that people bring into the custodial space with them, particularly when it's, it's uh, either generally health-related or um, in a more complicated sense where it's, where it's um, uh, mental health. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to uh, comment either indirectly or directly about whether or not uh, it is a fact that people don't get the medication that they require. I think we would need to hear from, uh, from medical professionals who make that judgment on a day-to-day on -day basis. If I may offer um, some commentary uh, in terms of the, you know, the experiences uh, of remand, I think, you can, I think you can look at this in, in two ways. Um, you know, the experience of being sent into custody, whether it's on remand and conviction uh, or conviction, uh, sorry, uh, can be for many people an incredibly disconnecting uh, and troubling and confusing experience, particularly for those that are experiencing the first time in custody. But I think it's also true, whether we like it or not, that for many people who make their way into custody, uh, particularly those who regrettably are on the treadmill, uh, and those that um, spend very short periods of time uh, with us. Many of them have chaotic lifestyles uh, when they're in the community. And it's, it's almost a perverse uh, aspect of custody that it can bring stability and it can bring access to services and resources that may or may not have either been available or that individual had been accessing uh, whilst they're in the community. So whilst 
I, I do understand concerns around you know, reasons, in this case, for remand, or potentially concerns about the overuse of remand. I think the, the disconnect, the worry, uh, the family concerns about remand are absolutely legitimate, and we are equally concerned about them as, as our partners. But there are, perversely, if you like, there are positives um, that individuals can experience by being sent to custody, particularly for those who have chaotic lifestyles uh, prior to that point. And there is, there is some good comes of that. Given that we've heard that it can, it's usually just a short period of time if, if they're not you know, um, um, convicted, um, what do you do to prepare them then during that short period? What are the positives in that short period of time? And I think, again, as, as um, your partners have, have suggested, uh, it's very, very difficult and very challenging. I mean, the median um, number of days that uh, people spend on remand in Scotland is 27. Now, obviously, there's a range, but the median point is 27. And frankly, I think no matter which organisation uh, you would be questioning on that basis, that's, that's a huge challenge for us to, to do things that are... Um, not only immediately positive, but those things that are sustained positives as people move through the process. But undoubtedly, the positives uh, could be and will be for those that have chaotic lifestyles uh, in the community, will be stability, will be access to uh, particularly uh, medical uh, opinion uh, and support, uh, as well as getting signposting and gateway access to the many uh, specialised and, and caring partnership organisations that are there in the community anyway, but individuals may or may not either be aware or may not be accessing. And again, I think it's one of those, um, some might say, perverse positives that comes out of being sent into custody that at least we can make those connections. Uh, we would rather, of course, uh, that, on, that only had to happen where it absolutely had to happen, uh, but we are where we are. And I think it's important that the committee considers that you know, whilst there are many negatives, there are a number of positives that, that come from that experience too. Um, Mary, would you like to? I think following on from the last point that Colin raised there, um, we have had families saying that they feel relieved that their son or daughter is in prison um, because it's the first time for a while they've been able to sleep um, because they're wondering, is, you know, are they going to come back? Is the police going to come to the door? So for some families, they do feel that sense of relief when they are put in prison. But I think for remand prisoners, um, the families, they don't know the length of time that they're going to be in. It could be for seven days or it could go up to a year before their case comes to court. So that's always a concern that they can't plan, they can't gauge how long the person's going to be in prison. Regarding the medications, um, we have had families tell us that they are extremely concerned about their family member in prison because sometimes the person cannot articulate to the medical services what the problems are that they have. And I did write in my report about um, many families have said to us that their son or daughter has had, mainly sons, have had ADHD or autism and it's never been properly diagnosed. And this is something that we're hearing more and more and I really feel it's something I would ask us to look at and maybe we should start gathering more data on that. So again, if um, young people go into prison and they do have ADHD or autism, which hasn't been properly diagnosed, they're not therefore going to have the proper medication which they require. Um, another thing, um, young people, mental health, issues are a problem as well for families. They get extremely concerned if they're up at a visit and they feel their, their loved one, um, their mental health is starting to take a, a, a downward um, spiral and are they going to get access to um, nurses and doctors? And we do always try and reassure families that those um, aspects of the health will be monitored. But um, we would then introduce the family contact officers. If any family comes down and says to us, they've been at the visit, they're really concerned, we would then immediately uh, raise that with the family contact officers or frontline manager to get to the whole staff and they can then keep a close monitor of that young person. Okay, thank you. Um, Daniel, you've got a supplementary? Yes, I, I'd just like to ask a, a brief supplementary to both Neil Clark and then subsequently Colin McConnell. Could you just briefly outline um, the nature of the, the disorders that the people are... are, are failing to receive the, their medication for and, and what the, the, the impacts are. And I, I recognise 
based on what Colin McConnell said, that this is anecdotal, but if you could just maybe just elaborate a little bit on, on that point, and, and how long are people going without their medication? Again, anecdotally in your experience. Yes, so, so in our experience, as I said in the written submission, around 20% of the referrals we've had in about three and a half years in the prison relate to people on remand. So in numbers terms, it's only about 30, 35 people we're talking about. And of those people, it's you know less than half of them have had the ongoing issues with medication. So it's it's a small number that we've dealt with. However, you know, there's nothing that makes me think it's not happening to other people in the prison we are not aware of, or possibly other establishments. I can only speak to, to HMB Kilmarnock. Okay. Um, of those people, the the mental health issues range from you know depression and anxiety right through to, to people who have been on antipsychotic medication that they've had to go a number of months without. Um, and again, there are, you know, we appreciate there are issues in the prison environment when it comes to security or you know, the medical issues that the, the medical professionals can speak to, but we've, I've argued previously, you know, just because of the risk that someone might be bullied for a medication or misuse it, that doesn't mean everyone that's due that medication you know, there's, there are people that genuine need that sometimes go without, they maybe suffer because there's a concern that yeah. it's going to be misused. Um, and just, can I just pick up on the point about the ADHD and autism? I've, we've dealt with a number of people who've had a diagnosis of ADHD or autism previously, but then sometimes there's a dispute over when that diagnosis is taking place sure. and whether it actually exists. So there can be people that maybe have been on medication mm -hmm. previously due to a diagnosis that might be assessed again. And then there's a kind of mismatch between what the, the person thinks their diagnosis is and the medication should be and what the healthcare professionals are saying based on a more up-to-date assessment. So a lot of that's to do with communication, I think, between healthcare and the people involved. Um, can I just also briefly say that I, I, I'm in my main, main, main line of questioning, I'm going to bring up the issue of, of ADHD, um, uh, which will come later in the session. And can I also just at this point declare an interest, and I, I, I'm both diagnosed with ADHD and, and medicated, which is why I'm particularly interested mm -hmm. in this. Um, but just Colin McConnell, I mean, just following on from that, given the nature of, of the, the prison population, there is, can I put it like this, a high degree of comorbidity of these sorts of issues and, and people who offend. Um, and, and you said that it's more complicated with mental health issues. Can I, can I just maybe probe you on that, on, on why it's more complicated? And indeed, given that, that, that comorbidity, shouldn't it be a, a priority? And, and why, frankly, if I could just put it flippantly, and I recognise it's not as simple as this, but why isn't it as simple as picking up the phone to the, the family GP and, and finding out what medication these people need? Um, I mean, I would like to be uh, as a public servant as helpful to the committee as I, I possibly can be. Um, but in, uh, to answer your question, you, you need to have a medical professional uh, here because we simply can't do that. Uh, as I say, it's not to be un unhelpful. As, as a layperson, though, uh, I mean, it does um, strike me, and given the, the very nature of the population that we care for uh, in prisons, uh, many of the people who uh, we look after uh, have incredibly troubled uh, backgrounds and multiple uh, needs uh, and deficits. It's just, it's just the nature, sadly, uh, of the population for now that makes its way into prison. So I simply say as a layperson, um, it is complex for us as an organisation with our many partners, uh, professional, third sector, voluntary sector, to put together a package of appropriate responses uh, and care plans uh, to make sure that we cover all the needs and requirements of every single person that passes our way. Now, that's our ambition, that's our ideal. Um, I, I think it would be um, uh, probably uh, a statement too far uh, for me to say as head of the prison service that we manage that in every single regard. Uh, I, I think that's probably not the case. But going back to uh, some of the observations, the anecdotes that, that Neil has uh, understandably uh, shared, um, the committee needs to uh, appreciate that neither I uh, nor a prison governor uh, working locally uh, has any uh, power or authority, uh, be it legal or moral, uh, to say to a medical professional, you're not prescribing uh, that. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised, I, I have to say, 
uh, at uh, the sense that somehow uh, we have uh, power of veto uh, over a medical uh, professional in terms of what he or she may or may not uh, prescribe. The prison environment is, is challenging, I think, as Neil has, has touched on, and as all the committee members uh, will know. Um, prisons are complex places uh, to manage, and bullying it does go on. There, there is violence uh, in our prisons. I wish it were not so, but that's, that's the case. I think our prisons, as the Chief Inspector has often reported, uh, however, are decent, safe, and secure uh, places. But to interrupt you there, I, I didn't hear anyone suggesting that the, the prison severed had a, a power of veto over any medication. I think there's a real issue about information being passed on. And I wonder too, um, if someone has been there, they've got enduring, as I think the advocacy paper says, and severe mental health problems, and they keep ending up on remand and in prison. Is there some record? So I think we're going to the very heart of data collection. You know, is there any record someone's been there before so you know they have mental health issues, you know they're prescribed certain medication? Is that passed on? If I could just ask you to indulge me, convener, just, just for a minute for that point of clarification. I'm, I'm concerned, and I, I think it's important that the committee considers this, that any uh, inference that, that um, medical professionals are not prescribing appropriate medication um, because of concerns... Uh, that the prison service may have. Uh, I don't think, I do not believe that is the case. I don't think there's any it's evidence. There's been any suggestion. You can that's, put your mind fine. at rest on that, so no okay. need to labour that Thank point at all, Mr. McConnell. But there is a point, I think, on the, the data collection. And I noticed, for example, you mentioned um, the medium remand time 27 days, but these figures, uh, 27 days, these figures are between 2007 and 8 and 2012 13 as the most up to date information available. Why is that? Uh, these are the figures that the Scottish Government's uh, Justice uh, and Analytics Department uh, produces. Uh, so we're, we're all in the same boat with that. Those are the figures that, that we use. The prison service does not uh, separately uh, keep data on the basis that these are court processes. Uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from. I think, I think there are uh, data collection, data communication uh, issues but it's not something which particularly falls to the prison service uh, to produce. Now, we are part of the justice system, uh, for sure, uh, and I think what the committee has already uh, identified, and I've, I've looked at the record that's been produced, uh, is a need for um, you know, the justice system to work more collaboratively uh, together to make sure that those, uh, those figures, that data, is, is available and available to people. To Jess, this was done. Do we need someone to coordinate it with that particular responsibility? Because it's not being done just now, we've heard from uh, Ms Cairns that someone can go in with ADHD, autism, and, and that's not known about. Um, we've heard from Mr Mr Clark that they can have, or in the written submission, um, severe and enduring mental health problems, and they end up there practically by default. So how do, how do we get this, this de data on record to identify the problem and therefore the need to be addressed? In terms of who, you know, following up directly to your, your, your point, I mean, who ends, who ends up in custody, again, it's not, it's not a matter for, uh, for the prison service. It's a, it's a process for the courts in terms of who ends up in prison. Understand me, I'm talking about the collection of data once they're there. I understand you don't yeah. determine who comes before you. You are referred to prisoners, but once they're there the collection of data? I, th I think it's a, it's a challenge for the justice system as, as a whole. Uh, I don't think it's for me to determine uh, how the justice system should, should come together to do that. I simply accept the point that you're making, and it's well recorded, that the data appears to be lacking uh, and there's improvement required. But you have suggested there should be a more holistic approach to it. Oh, I, well, I think that's, that's an incontrovertible point to make, yes. Daniel, have you... Completed your line of questioning. We've got For three now, other. Yeah. Yeah. Fulton, Liam Kerr, then John. It's, a, it's following up from uh, that point, and it's for, for Colin McConnell. Um, again, do you notice any difference when somebody comes from um, court on remand if it's a mental health condition or a physical condition? And perhaps when I'm saying physical condition, maybe, you know, heart medication. Um, something like that, something that the person would need that night. Because I think this is it. <clears throat> this is the crux of the matter here. It's about, it's not about, 
you implement a veto or anything like that. I think you work really, really hard, and I don't, I don't think anybody's suggesting that. But I think the issue is that families and um, the committee's heard before that there's, there's a delay in medication. And I'm wondering what your view is on um, when somebody is sent from remand, say they're either new to the system, or if they're not new, that doesn't matter. When they come in, is there a di do you see a difference between the way mental health problems are treated to physical health problems? Again, as I, I said right at the start of my evidence, um, you know, I think from my perspective, uh, it's very clear uh, to me what a person uh, has in their possession in terms of medication is a judgment for medical professionals. Now, whether that's, as you pointed it out, uh, or as you've posed the question, um, something that is not mental health related or something that is or something that's both. Uh, you know, these are, these are issues that have to be determined and properly considered by medical professionals. To interrupt, but I know we've kind of went over that point. I think that if MDs own any medication for anything, then it's already been determined by a health professional, albeit in the community. And I think what I'm trying to ask is, um, rather than put all the onus on the prison services, what do you think could be done to make sure that that information, the prescription of any medication, um, can be relayed to you as quickly as possible? Following on from Daniel and the convener's points, what, how can it be relayed to you as quickly as possible so that nobody goes into any delay, whether it's hours or days or weeks, it doesn't matter, it doesn't go any delay? What, what do you think can be done at the stage of remand being implemented? It's, 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 a, it's a communication issue for, for the NHS between health boards and uh, the prison in which uh, you know, health boards, jurisdiction, uh, those, those issues uh, have to be addressed. Um, but I am, I am going to labour the point, because I think it's really important, uh, that decisions relating to the medical care uh, of an individual passing into custody are made by properly qualified health professionals. On that particular point, Lee, Lee McArthur and then slightly, Lee Kerr. I'm slightly disturbed by this. I mean, I can, I can appreciate why the decision around the, the, the medication and any other care needs is a matter for the health professionals. There is surely a duty of care on the prison service and you as chief executive of the prison service to ensure that, that those that are within uh, our prison estate um, are, uh, are receiving the, the, the care and the attention that they need. Now, if suggestions are being made that this isn't happening um, in either particular prisons or in particular circumstances, I would hope that that duty of care extends to you not ex extending a veto over anybody's decision, but at least challenging and questioning the advice that's being received in the way that's being received. And, and if there are issues around bullying and and threats of violence and medication being misused, then that's a question of how the medication is administered, not surely the withholding of the medication entirely. I'm, 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 I'm entirely agreeing with the point you make. Uh, and, you know, the responsibilities, as you've described them, uh, that we hold for people passing into our care are, are absolute. Um, but there are, there are issues that we address in partnership with other agencies. And the discussion, so far as it's been uh, here this morning, has related uh, to health issues and, and the, the added complications when people have multiple needs and, and deficits. But the fact remains that these are issues that we work in partnership with the NHS. And issues relating to what medication and how it's administered uh, fall within the purview of qualified medical professionals. Indeed, but qualified medical professionals um, aren't necessarily generalists across the piece, and they may be qualified in some areas but less qualified in others. And one of the issues that's been raised is in relation to mental health, possibly with undiagnosed uh, conditions prior to coming in, but there's an opportunity, opportunity then when they enter into the prison estate mm -hmm. to actually identify and, and respond to those needs and I think what's being raised is a, is a question mark as to whether or not um, the, the medical uh, professionals have the expertise to provide that diagnosis and that advice in relation to some mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I, Mr MacArthur, I, I, I can't comment on whether they, they are appropriately qualified or not. I take it on, on assurance that, that, that they are in terms of the decisions they make. The, the general provision of, of services uh, in, in the Scottish Prison Service, of course, is overlapping and multifaceted. So our staff do work on an advocacy basis when um, 
people in our care express concerns or uh, demonstrate behaviours that might cause us concern, as, as do uh, our partner organisations. We also have, as you know, um, monitors representing uh, the Chief Inspector uh, working in our prisons who also uh, act on an advocacy uh, basis. So, you know, people in our care do have, I think, levels of support that may not be present elsewhere in making sure that their concerns and their worries uh, are properly uh, presented and represented to uh, the professionals or, or those organisations that are there to provide those, those services. You know, I, wish, I wish I could give you, by the sound of it, a more convincing answer than I, I appear to be giving you, but the reality is that issues that are specialist of that nature in terms of you know, what illnesses or otherwise that someone coming into custody uh, may bring in with them or may develop, we do rely on suitably and properly qualified colleagues making those judgments and then working with us to make sure that people are properly cared for. Put it another way, you're the first point of contact when they come into the prison and therefore they may say to you, I haven't got my medication. They may um, be displaying this behaviour you think is indicative of perhaps there may be a problem, mental health problem. Yeah. Isn't there some way that you record this and then take out these concerns yes. with the appropriate medicine? And how fast is that done? Yeah. On, on the day of uh, reception, uh, there is a, a standard process, I hate to describe it like that, but there is a standard process that everyone received in our care uh, goes through. Part of that process is seeing a fully qualified nurse uh, who goes through uh, a series of questions and discussions uh, around health, mental health and well-being uh, with every single individual who's referred into our care. So and at what point of time is that, does that happen? I mean, it won't be the minute they come in and they're presented to you where they may well say, look, I've just arrived here and I haven't got my medication. Well, I mean, yes, it is within reason. And let me try and explain that because it's part of the reception process. So before someone leaves reception and moves to their, their place of residence, they will already have seen a qualified nurse who will have taken them through all those issues. We also address concerns about um, uh, self-harm. Uh, all of that is discussed uh, as well. History of self-harm plus any concerns well, that well, people may ask be... Well, what happens to that, that information then? I mean, why is there a gap if at that point They've presented, the nurse has seen them within um, hours of them being there. There's still this gap and they're ending out without any medication. Well, I, I, I make the point, uh, convener, that I think, I think we need to, well, I'm certainly concerned with, with the evidence of that. I hear an anecdotes that, that people go uh, without medication, but we have health professionals making judgments about what medication if indeed that person brings medication with them, uh, what medication goes with them into their place of residence. Uh, and taking this conversation further, I would also uh, expect that those medical professionals are making onward uh, connections to pharmacists or to the GP if there are concerns that different medication or more medication is required. But it's not something that I can particularly comment on. All right. I don't think we're going to get too much further with that, but I think you've gathered there's quite a lot of concern around I, the, I understand the, the table yes. about how this is operating in practice. Liam Kerr, yeah, supplementary. Thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, uh, we've explored how things appear to be at the moment. Uh, two of the submissions, and Marie Cairns this morning, both talk about possible solutions uh, or developments going forward. One is assuming that mental health concerns, this is not revelatory. This, people have known about mental health issues coming into the system for, for some time. So it begs the question, what, what is in train at the moment to look at this area and to improve uh, the, the system? And how far are we from a possible solution? Possibly make a suggestion. I've worked in social care for almost 20 years, mainly working in Glasgow in residential care with homeless people. Many of our service users were in and out of prison often. But I was really shocked when I came to work um, at Polmont um, when I realised that all the care plans, for example, which are made up while the person is in residential care, 
that is not transferred over to the prison. Now, that is a massive amount of information regarding that person, which I cannot believe that all that information could just be, obviously would need to be through data sharing and all within legislation, mm -hmm. but they're missing out such a wealth of information. And again, it can also help SPS staff knowing the triggers for somebody's, somebody maybe to go into self-harm or they know the medications. There's just a wealth of knowledge in those care plans that I feel would be a great advantage um, to SPS staff. Thank you. This then, Marie Cairns, if you would, it, it, on that point, so, so you've proposed a solution there. You've said this could be better. This is only a very personal, uh, no, no, that's personal, <laughs> personal um, opinion and suggestion. Neil Clark, for example, you, you say various things in, in the submission uh, about here's how it could be made better. Uh, but what is being... My, my question is, uh, solutions have been proposed, solutions are being suggested. What's being done about that? Uh, who is taking that ball and running with it? Well, this is the first time I've had a chance to suggest that. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't often get the opportunity. I mean, I did speak to the governor one day at briefing, um, and I did say that I was really surprised that that did not happen. Um, and they were hoping that maybe in the future that could be looked at, because I know um, SPS staff now are being trained to look at the more holistic um, approach of a person and looking into doing care plans. But that's not something that's done, as I understand as readily as it would be done, for example, if someone was in social care. Mm -hmm. But even the two years that I worked in secure care um, with young people, um, all that information was transferred if they moved on to Pullman or um, prison after when they reached 16 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From, from our perspective, I think it really comes down to information sharing and communication, particularly within just NHS. There's been a few occasions where people we have supported, the, the mental health team and a psychiatrist has had to wait for their medical records to be sent on from a previous establishment or other local authority. So you, know, you would think maybe this day and age everything's on the computer. It would be accessible, but it's not always the case. Um, more locally, we're, you know, we're working on you know, speaking to new prison officers during the training and we're also working on referral pathways. There's a multidisciplinary mental health team meeting between prison management and NHS. So we're working on developing a way so that you know, people that there are concerns about their mental health, we can access them and, and try and kind of link up and make sure the communication's there. So. Okay. Thank you. John Finney. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, can I ask about particular issues for females and young people um, in Roman, please? Well, <laughs> we find um, <coughs> that we engage with many families of young of male offenders. Um, I think the impact on females is colossal. The families that we have engaged with who are visiting females, um, the stories are really quite sad. One wee girl that I think of often, she come in with her grandpa and I was having a wee chat with her and we asked her if she would, she loved colouring in and things. So we said, would you do us a favour? We're really looking for somebody to design a wee voucher that we can put in the induction packs to invite people to come onto the bus and to come into the visitor centre. Yes, aha, I would love to, but I'll need to ask my mum. Now I assumed that she was going up to visit her brother because at that time the girls had just come to Pullman. And I was shocked and I felt so sad when her mum was one of the prisoners that she was going up to visit. So a week or so later, she was supposed to hand in the voucher and she didn't. And her grandpa said um, she didn't have any colouring in, cranes or anything to do. But when I saw that wee girl with her grandpa, her grandpa obviously adores her. He's got full custody of her. But that wee girl was only nine and I just thought how she needs her mum. Um, Several families that we have engaged with, um, it's just it's just so sad. I mean, it's so sad for anybody that's in prison, but the females in prison, it does have a major impact on I always feel the children who need their, their mum there. Um, they do say that females um, get very little visits from the families. It tends to be the young, young males who get most of the visits. They tend to get visits from their partners, mums, dads, grandparents. But they say when females are in custody, the male partners are less likely to visit. Um, they tend to have other things to do. And I've spoken to 
prison staff who worked in Corton Vale eh, and they said the same, the visit numbers for the females were very, very low. Other panel members' comments at all, please? Can I? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I was going to add that Families Outside are doing a piece of work with the Prison Reform Trust on transferring li lives agenda. So that's for women. It's a three-year project and it's focused on reducing the use of imprisonment for women. Um, one sort of notable model highlighted through this project is the positive work that's been done, um, a triage between Police Scotland and the NHS. So that's bringing those bodies who are concerned for women into, into the picture, into focus, and they are sharing information and it's about directing women away from imprisonment. I think that's key. I think it's really important. I think women have additional difficulties um, as opposed to men going into prison. They might have children that need to be accommodated. Um, the, the loss of housing, income. I mean, some are, are similar to what um, the male population is going through. But the supporting networks, as Marie has highlighted, are not there for women as much as they are there for men. So it is a constant battle um, when women go into prison, whether it's on remand or whether it's a longer sentence. And we're working to sort of look at ways to, to, to dispel that. And would you have a comment on younger people on remand as well? Is there... Younger people, we tend to um, we tend to hear a lot from um, parents and from grandparents who are supporting young people um, who may have lost their way, and they're they're struggling to sort of cope with the enormity of someone going into prison when they may have seen their their own children go into prison and now their grandchildren are there. Um, there there are a number of very very good projects working um, at Polmont and in other well, mostly Polmont, actually, and in the community, working with young people. But it's, it's, I think it's probably an ongoing battle at this moment. I wonder, Mr McConnell, from the responsibility you have, are there particular challenges with dealing with females and young people in your estate? I, I think, as the committee has already uh, heard, Mr Finney, I think those, you know, those challenges, those, those difficulties that, that adults face... Uh, women and young people, be they um, young men or, or young women, face, face them and, and some because of the issues associated, uh, particularly as has been uh, quite rightly expressed here with, with, with women uh, and the, the issues associated with, with adolescence for, for young people. Uh, and it is particularly distressing uh, for you know, people like me that work in the system and has, has done for a number of years. Um, to see particularly young people uh, coming into custody, uh, whether on, on remand or, 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 or conviction, but in this case we're, we're talking about remand, who are absolutely bewildered uh, by, by the experience. And you know, I, I agree with the comments that, that all my colleagues have, have made here, that you know, there's a lot of good things happening to try and ameliorate some of the, the worst aspects of that, but being sent into custody on remand, particularly if it's, it's a first experience, is absolutely traumatic. And can I move on to ask about through care? Uh, does the Scottish Prison Service, along with partner agencies, is that something that they pick up? And indeed, is it applied at all to remand prisoners? Um, it's, it's one of the, um, I think, particular strengths of the Scottish Prison Service in, in this case, and you've, you've heard it touched on here. Uh, is um, the all-encompassing aspect of, I think, the responsibilities that, that we see uh, for, for those that pass in, into our care and, and for society more, more generally. I mean, we have a, a group of specially trained staff now through care support officers who are working uh, across the service, uh, and we are expanding that service into those who are sent to us on remand where they want it. It's not a compulsory service. It's where they, they want help. And again, what we're doing is linking with other organisations and agencies who pass through that boundary of prisons and, and the community to try as best we can to provide wraparound services for, for people who are passing in and out of the, you know, the custody continuum, because for some that's, that's what it is. I'm really grateful that um, it's already been commented on here in terms of the development of, of staff uh, in the SPS. And again, you know, one of our, our major development programmes is the Prison Officer Professionalisation Programme, uh, which will, uh, in but a few years' time, you know, deliver a, a professional uh, workforce in the Scottish Prison Service uh, with a um, professional qualification and professional standards, much of which will pick up in sense of the approach that social work uh, takes. 
uh, as well as, again, the, the advocacy services that other organisations helpfully provide. Are you, are you able to comment on the uptake of uh, people on remand for your through care? Because it was a relatively small number of officers. Are you able to say you talked about it expanding? Is I, can, that... I, I can certainly write to the committee uh, with that. Uh, because, it, because it's voluntary, uh, I think it's more difficult to, to follow that up. But I'll certainly write to the committee uh, with, with, with And with the increasing details. number of staff, is, it, is that significant? Is it spread out geographically? Uh, all uh, bar uh, three of our prisons uh, have locally located as staff, but the service is available uh, nationally. The Prison Officer Professionalisation Programme, uh, which uh, we will have the fundamental basics in place by the summer of 2019, will in fact deliver that level of training to all uh, 2,500 prison officers uh, in Scotland from there on out. Thank you. I don't know if Ms Stocker wanted to comment on through care at all. Um, certainly, we're making links with through care um, officers within the, the prison establishments, but at the other end. So it's not with um, remand prisoners, it's with those who have served short sentences. And we're certainly linking them with through care support officers to support family members. Um, when that person comes out of prison, they're going back to a home, hopefully, um, but they're going back to some sort of care. And sometimes the families need additional support at that point as well. OK, thank you very much indeed. Any <coughs> supplementary? Morning. Just very briefly, Elaine Stockley, you mentioned that there was a specific programme at Polman that was advantageous a number of uh, moments ago, and, and also others in the third sector. I just wondered if you wanted to elaborate on those programmes and, and why you think they're effective. I think we, we are, we're not involved directly with all the programmes, but there are a number of very good programmes going on um, in Polmont, for example, there are, and Marie could probably sort of give you more information about that, but parenting programmes. Again, nothing that remand, people on remand can actually access, unfortunately. So, whilst we're talking about remand here, none of these programmes are probably um, for those who are on remand. The Transforming Lives is, is um, it's a three-year project looking at reducing the use of imprisonment. So that's out in the community before someone goes into prison. Um, we know that um, the Bangkok rules, everyone's sort of aware of that, it is looking at um, prior to admission women with caretaking responsibilities. And again, this doesn't lie with our prison or with us in the community. This is probably more with sheriffs or judges. But the Bangkok rules mean that prior to or on admission, and I'm going to read this in case I get it wrong, women with caretaking responsibilities for children shall be permitted to make arrangements for those children, including the possibility of a reasonable suspension of detention taking into account the best interests of the children. Now, families outside are certainly happy to support this, but this is for any person with caretaking responsibilities. And what we are finding more, whether it's on the helpline or whether it's through our regional support coordinators who are working one-to-one, -one, is that there are a number of elderly people now going into prison um, on remand. So the caretaking responsibilities are also have a knock-on effect for them too. So th there, there are a number of things that we are involved in that we're working with um, family members to ensure that while someone's in, in on remand or even in custody for a longer period of time, we can support them through this, this, um, this trauma, I suppose, for many of the families that contact us. Thank you. And Mary Kerr, did you want to elaborate on Employment specifically? Uh, well, I can't really say too much about actually all of the services that are going on within the prison. Um, my understanding is that if people are in their own remand, they do not get access to lots of things that are available in prison. The boys, they don't get access to any of the work placements or lots of other things that are going on. If they're on remand, they really don't get access to anything. The provision is very, very poor. And that even goes as far as their benefits. They get no money, nothing at all. In fact, the chaplains have told me that they've often provided um, deodorants, clothes, stuff to wash their clothes. Um, if they don't have family going in to visit, then those boys have, and girls as well, would I assume, um, have nothing at all, unless they're being convicted. They have no access to anything that's going on in the prison. Thank you. Okay, um, and my question is on the uh, mitigating the potential negative effects of remand, and I think we've already talked a, a good bit about that. Um, and I think that you know, is, is there anything more that you can think be done? I mean, the main thing that's coming up today is uh, about information sharing. And I don't want to put any additional pressure on any other agency, but I think there's a lot of work being done over recent years in terms of um, when people go into a custodial sentence and we know that they would probably have a social work background report and stuff like that. So there's a lot of information available to 
the, the prison service, but who makes the information available um, for, for folk on remand? And Marie Cairns, you mentioned earlier an example, but, but whose responsibility would that be? Would it be the prison service to get the, the information from the service that you talked about? Would it be the service's responsibility? Would it be somebody at the court to pull all that together? So I suppose what I'm asking is, do you think it would be helpful, do the panel think it would be helpful if there was somebody, if the court was to appoint, um, you know, somebody at, at the point of remand whose responsibility it was to, I suppose, make sure that the information was passed on? And, I, and I'm guessing this could be done quite simply without a huge amount of resource. Um, I, I think that would be a good idea. Um, an, an example from HMP Kilmarnock, which only relates to short-term prisoners, um, Turning Point Scotland run a prison support pathways project. So they interview every short-term prisoner within, I think, about eight weeks of release. And then every fortnight, there's a meeting with all the external agencies, and we go through the list and make sure there's support, at least offered, to everyone that's due for liberation within the next couple of months. So something along those lines where there's, there's a central you know, agency or person collecting information and then making sure other agencies are, are aware of people, offering support for the community, whether it's you know, picking people up on the morning of liberation or taking someone to job centre to get their universal credit you know, sorted out. So at the very least offering that support to, to people that are not due for release. Can I ask particularly about housing? I mean, that's that's a key issue. It's maybe the major issue when someone is released from prison and the through care should be available. I mean, it doesn't come as rocket science to any of us. We know it's a major issue. So is there someone in the local authorities or in um, you know any other sector that, that you have contact with that, that, that there can be this um, this problem addressed head on and especially when it might be cross boundary issues and um, so the prisoner is in one location say is it Adiwell that's West Lothian but the majority of prisoners come from the Lanarkshire area which means it could be North South Lanarkshire is there a way to address that so it's not a case of well you're Release from Adiwell, um, nothing to do with West Lothian, and um, Lanarkshire says, "Well, you know, you were in prison there. You know, that's that's really nothing to do with us." Can anyone comment on that aspect? My understanding is that the person, say they do live in Lanarkshire, then Lanarkshire Housing would have a, a duty to place the person within that area. Again, it dep if the person has been in tenancy before they went into prison. The council will keep their house open or keep it for them for about three months, I think it is. But if the custodial sentence goes beyond that, then that's when they'll lose that tenancy. So if we become aware of any families um, who are needing support with housing, we would then support them to phone the housing. But often the, the families will be told, no, you need to wait till the person has been liberated. Then they need to declare themselves as homeless, which is really, I mean, if someone's been liberated from prison, to go to no, no home, I mean, that is a major problem. And even when I worked in secure care, I mean, I witnessed social workers coming up to the secure unit and taking children at 16 years of age who were being liberated and taking them to Hamish Allen Centre in Glasgow, which is a homeless accommodation place. I mean, it's putting them into the worst place. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm away on a tangent now. In answer to your question, um, they're normally told that they need to wait to have been liberated and then they declare themselves homeless at their local social work department. So is that something we can take up with the local authorities then to see if um, that, that can uh -huh, be absolutely. moved? I mean, yeah. they should mm -hmm. be in contact, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the date of liberation, yeah. roughly, I would yeah. imagine, and mm -hmm. something can be done within the prison. I think for some families, um, when the person goes into prison, they feel that's the last straw, they can't cope anymore, they've made that decision, you know, it could be as Connell, a, a, Colin was saying earlier, these young people are leading chaotic lives. Um, but for those uh, young people who are being liberated who don't have any family support at all, they are very much on their own and they do need some kind of support. But again, if they're on remand, they don't have access to through care workers and other agencies possibly that could help. In the panel's view, is that one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, given the, um, the potential for them to to fall into um, all sorts of problems if you're released and you don't have a secure place to go to and a kind of programme of how you can keep, um, the, keep 
well, just not go back to the behending, uh, offending behaviour and actually continue the regime that you, you started in prison? I think if you're going back to the same chaotic lifestyle with a house maybe in a high-rise block with no sort of family support, no sort of prospects of employment, then, you know, what are you going to do? And how can through care help that when, when it starts in prison? Well, we certainly know that the through care officers that are um, allocated to the people in prison, and again, um, as Colin says, this has to be on a volunteer basis, they will help that young person or that person or that female go um, to the housing department. You know, so they will walk the walk with them and make sure that they're, they're being heard. So whether that's on a Friday afternoon, which invariably it can be, um, they will have someone there to support them to do that. It's not always the case with remand, and if that's what we're looking at here today, you know, there can be people who have maybe had quite a few weeks on remand. They may have lost their house because they, they've passed over that point where they cannot keep the tenancy and they have nothing else to go back to. They might not have access to a through care support officer because of the time in prison. They might not have known about that. Um, so th there can be difficulties there as well. A valid point about Friday afternoon. You know, sometimes constituents phone up on a Friday afternoon. It's an emergency, and mm -hmm. it can be very difficult to, to then um, find a solution in the hurry. Um, thank you for that. We're now on to... Maurice, Maurice Corey, sorry, you had to uh, can, can I just say, I, I visited Low Moss Prison the other day, in fact, twice I've been there now, um, and the, the PSP programme, Prisoner Support Programme, uh, Mr Conn seems to be working very well, and that's, I'm encouraged by that. I have a particular interest on the veteran side, the armed forces who may be inside. But can I just come back to a point that Mary Cairns can absolutely agree with you. We had the same problem with veterans and also service leavers from the armed forces coming out. And for years we battled to get the records from the MOD health side into the GP practice. We've now achieved that. And it's a model I suggest you look at because we've now overcome that problem. So when a veteran or a, or a, a service leaver presents themselves at their local GP, the GP now has access to the full records of what that chap or, or lady went through. Um, and it can be quite substantial in making a decision to treat them. So I do recommend it. There is a model there. It works in the armed forces and outside the GPs, and the NHS have actually gone a long way to do that. So I would recommend, Mr Connolly, you go and speak to them, because it, there it is there. There's a model there, and I back up exactly what Mary Ken says. So hopefully any other comments on that. But do you think you could have a go at that? Um, I, th I, th I think the, the and thank you very much for, for identifying that. I think the appropriate forum is the Health and Justice Collaboration Improvement Board that's chaired by Paul Gray and Paul Johnson, um, with the very improvement in mind that you've you've just described. So, with with the committee's agreement, I'll, I'll refer that to uh, to that particular uh, board. Um, George, then Ben. Yep, just uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Just a very small supplementary in back of what Morris has already said. We're all aware there's so many good programmes happening in the prisons, but the concern we seem to be hearing now is that the average with Colin uh, McConnell saying it's, the average is 27 days in remand, then are these people just falling through the net? I'm just wanting to know the very basics. Are they falling through the net? Is there a process where they can get that support or are they just not getting that option when they're in remand? 27 days isn't, it's the median uh, point. Um, but it's not a lot of time to try and do something particularly productive uh, with, with someone. And it's not a lot of time, if, if I may um, be so crude in a sense, to suggest to, to join the dots. But if I may turn that on its head, um, you know, these are not people coming into, in this case, the prison system, who are entirely unknown to us. I mean, they're, they're citizens with some sort of history. I think the point that's been made by the committee and the point that, that colleagues are making here is that all that information that, that we do know about that particular citizen doesn't necessarily come come to the one point, and, and I, I'm accepting. Can I ask, you mentioned that earlier on, Colin, sorry to interrupt, uh, but uh, basically you mentioned that earlier on, and is, that, is, is, there a, is it process that's a problem there? Or is there a data protection problem? You know, why, why, why isn't that information shared? Yeah. But it could I, make your life a lot easier yeah. and the individual's yeah. life as well. I, I think it's all of that. Uh, I think there are information sharing uh, blockages. 
that are related to um, particular permissions that, that are not allowed to um, be given across organisations without the particular individual giving a say-so. Uh, but I think without doubt there are, there are system and process issues that simply get in the way because systems are un, in, incompatible. Um, now that is not uh, beyond us uh, to resolve, but it is, it is a huge, a huge challenge uh, for us. I mean, as, as the convener was understandably challenging me earlier on, I mean, my own thought processes took me to that point that when, when someone does pass into the custodial system, we would expect, would we not, that we know who this, uh, we know quite a lot about the citizen that we are passing into custody. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think there's something about the need for a collected view at that point, which is related to, probably, to the judgment to send someone into custody, that sends that someone with a package of knowledge uh, into that place where he or she is going to stay for a period of time. Okay. Anyone else? No? Right. Okay. Ben? Thank you, Convener. I thought the Convener's questions around ho housing provision uh, when people are, are, are leaving custody um, after, after remand uh, was a, an important one. And on a related matter, another area that is uh, sometimes problematic, and this from constituency casework and, and elsewhere, is around accessing social security from the DWP. And I wondered if you could elaborate on any interaction the DWP is already having with the service in terms of those um, leaving remand, uh, and if there's any uh, scope for improvement there. I uh, saw so you nodding your head, Marie, so perhaps you could go first. Well, we can only go on the information that families share with us, and at that particular time um, of need that they, they, they bring to us. We have heard many stories of families, particularly if they are um, receiving their benefits in a joint account. So if the person goes into prison, for the person who's left at home, it's really difficult for them then to get their benefits because the other person's in prison and it's a big hullabaloo for them to try and get through to DWP um, the fact that someone's in prison and they still need to get their benefits and it can create all sorts of problems for them that way. Um, general, I don't know, I really can't speak. We don't have much access to the prisoners themselves when they are liberated or even when they're in prison. So I don't really, I can't really speak for the actual individual prisoners. I can only go speak for what the families have told us. Thank you. Anyone, anyone, anyone else? Yeah. I think we too are aware of the family issues and the impact of imprisonment, whether it's for a week on remand or whether it's a custodial sentence, can have a huge effect on the family and it affects income, housing, relationships all of the above. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's not just, you can, you, sometimes you just can't pigeonhole one. You know, one mm. can probably start the ball rolling and it impedes on all the other thought processes, all the other um, situations that the family are going through. And that includes the person in the prison who is also part of that family. Mm -hmm. do, do you um, want to go a In the Link Centre, um, NHMP Kilmarnock, we are mostly the external agencies are based. There are two work coaches from DWP, so we have quite a lot of contact with them. Um, in terms of the man prisoners, they can ask to see the work coaches the same way they can ask to see the housing advisors. And, and that can happen before release? Yeah, right. so they, they make a point of seeing all the prisoners before liberation, obviously, with remand, they may not necessarily know when mm -hmm. they're going to be you know, back at court or liberated, but the prisoners themselves can, can request an appointment, they can put a referral into the link centre, so if they've got any queries, they can be face to face with an advisor. Uh, some are agencies as well. This is mainly for short term prisoners on liberation. They can pick up the prisoners in the morning. They'll take them to the housing office. They'll take them to the job centre as well to make sure all of these things are put in motion immediately. Did you, did you want to come in, Mr. Yes. McConnell? It's, it's a very good point. I mean, all, all of our uh, prisons across uh, Scotland have a link centre or something of a similar, a similar title. Um, and the focus is it brings you know, the person who's in our care into contact with those, those service providers that's going to support him or her when, when they're released. And that happens right across, across the country. The minimum contact is six weeks uh, ahead of the point of, of liberation. And again, picking up on some of the, the, the convener's uh, points uh, from earlier, I mean, that is intended to make sure the best uh, will intended that 
someone has a, a home to go to, has the connections with DWP, has some connection with a GP appointment, and so on and so forth. That happens right across the country. And that's obligatory rather than voluntary? No, the, um, the link centres, as described, work for every single person who has been uh, convicted, uh, regardless of the time that they spend with us. But there's a need for a distinction here. So for those people who are sentenced to four years or over, there is a statutory provision uh, which criminal justice social work uh, provides. So that link is there for the longer term uh, 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 people in, in our care. Uh, for those who are serving short sentences, there is no statutory provision, provision. So SPS effectively grew the through care support service initially to plug that gap. But because it's not statutory, it can only be done on a voluntary basis. So we reach in uh, to the people in our care. We try to encourage them, as do our partners, to engage with us so that we can have a robust plan. And again, as, as has been touched on here, and this is for people who are serving sentences, so that when they are released, someone goes with them. In a number of cases, it might be a prison officer. In other cases, it will be some, someone for a voluntary agency uh, or a third sector uh, organisation to both act as support and, and advocate to these, uh, these other uh, contact agencies. In the discussion we have here, and again, it's, I think it's a statistic worth considering, that in terms of stock and churn, there is a difference. So for the remand population, the stock is about 17% of the people living in our prison in any given day. But the actual churn, uh, is about 50%. So the throughput of, of the prison uh, through reception, about 50% of that is driven by those on remand, where actually the day-to-day -day stock is, is about uh, 17 or so percent. So when you begin to then factor in your 27 days median point, you begin to get the sense of the scale of the challenge to try and join all those dots, make all those connections uh, for the thousands of people that are passing in and out of our um, in and out of receptions for very short periods of time, many of whom who are already passing into our care, having spent years of chaotic lifestyle. Thank you. Uh, Daniel. So I, I'd just like to follow up on some of the things that we we, we touched on about the the opportunity to sort of engage and intervene when people are on run, and I'd like to begin by looking at the specifics of, of, of ADHD. Um, so some studies have concluded that about 20% of the prison population have ADHD, and that stands in comparison with about 3 to 4% of the general adult population having that. Indeed, studies also uh, uh, show that, that potentially up to half the prison population also may have had uh, ADHD as, as children. Given that, I mean, what particular interventions do you think could be made and indeed I note that there's a currently a study uh, taking place at Pullman whereby uh, young offenders are being screened for, for ADHD and, and that being immediately followed up so I'd just like to start with Marie Cairns do you think that that is a you know something that that, that is a sensible uh, practice uh, helpful and, and do you think that it, it, it potentially shows what we might want to do for, for other conditions or uh, issues that, that people might have. I was just wondering what your thoughts were. I was unaware that that screening was um, taking place in Pullman and I'm delighted to hear if it is. But the families that we have spoken to, they feel that even as children, they found it very, very difficult for the family to be supported either through the GP or the education system to get the child assessed first of all and then if there is a, a proper diagnosis. So it starts right away from childhood. So I would suggest if um, more support could be given to families of young children the families suspect may have ADHD, then that would be, that would be a great starting point. Um, obviously, if they're doing screening programmes in Pullman, that's, that's really, really good. It's good to hear that, and I would hope that that would continue in other placements as well. Um, and as well as ADHD, I think any mental health problem that maybe, again, the young person cannot articulate or cannot explain if they're not getting the opportunity to speak to the right person, whether it be a qualified um, nurse or CPN or whatever um, is required. One of the things that I come across quite regularly talking to, to support groups, both for ADHD and other underlying mental health conditions, is the, 
the sort of the lack of um, recognition that, that, that many people with addiction problems are actually self-medicating. Um, so, you know, for example, the ADHD medication are fundamentally stimulants, so people abusing those sorts of substances quite often self-medicating, but that's also true of other disorders. Do you think there's enough work going on within the prison service to, to, to not just address the substance misuse problems, but, but maybe try to peel back and, 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 and interrogate whether or not there's a, a more fundamental mental health or neurodevelopmental disorder that may be at play? And, and Colin, I'll, I'll come back to you on these points as well. Well, I think obviously I don't work in the press. We only work with the families. But what I would suggest, I mean, it must be a minefield for the prison staff when a, a person is brought into a custody because they know nothing about that person. And where do they possibly start? I mean, it's so overwhelming for somebody when they do get brought into prison. I know the family contact officers and other staff do go and speak with them right initial. When they come in, they have an induction period and they'll go through everything that's available to them in prison. But often the staff will say it's such an overwhelming experience for them that it's difficult for them to take in all the information and they also then do they want to go and admit to can I speak to a doctor or a nurse because then they're going to be maybe made a fool of by their peers so it's such a it's such a minefield um, I can imagine when someone's in prison um, I really don't know that I'm the right person yeah, to no, answer no, your well, question. I, I just with Elaine Stalker and Neil Clark do you have any thoughts about the opportunities that there might be to, to identify and address issues whether that's addiction, mental health, or, or indeed other things as people uh, enter remand? I feel it's unfair to um, put all the blame at the prison no, door. I, um. I, I'm not, I'm, it's actually the other way around. Is there an opportunity here is, is really what I'm asking, rather than actually putting any blame anywhere? Um, I would like to say yes. I, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to think where that might be. Um, I think certainly there, there's scope for working. As we say, there, there are many um, possibilities, opportunities in the community now. But it's actually the young people who are in this chaotic lifestyle are not able to access that before they get to the prison. So, you know, it, it's a sort of cart and horse scenario. Um, so the young people who need it, need it the most are probably not being directed to where they can get the support in the community, so do end up in our prison environment um, where... You know, by then it's probably too late. We get a number of um, family members contacting us to say, you know, we've been let down every step of the way, whether that was early education, whether it was NHS, whether it was support from social work, and now we find that um, my son is, is in Polmont and that's going to be the rest of his life. So, you know, are there er earlier opportunities to be able to engage with that young person? I would like to say yes, but it, it's, it's taking them there. It's getting them there. Mr. Clark, do you have anything? To yeah, I think I think there are definitely opportunities. I think, in, in our experience, the addiction service in HMP Kilmarnock is definitely a good practice because they're very good at getting people stable. Normally, people that are there for maybe not on demand are there for you know, a number of weeks or months, but um, they're very good at getting people stable and then allowing them to try and you know plan ahead for liberation. Um, but I think there's definitely an opportunity, whether it is for mental health, you know, when we talk about some people struggle to articulate um, their experiences or their views, you know, that's, that's where we can support people, so that's why we, we're aiming to get referrals as early as possible, so we can support people to assist them in articulating how they're feeling, um, and hopefully linking them up with services so that they can, um, they can start to plan ahead for liberation. A lot of the people we work with they are motivated to try and turn their lives around. They might you know, have a chaotic background, but they want to use the time they're in custody to try and get stable, whether it's on methadone or getting mental health support, and try and avoid you know, the revolving door of, of ending up back in custody. So, so, so I mean, Colin McConnell, just before I come back to you, I mean, the, the study at Pullman, I understand, is based on, on uh, work in Sweden, where they found that, that doing this sort of screening and getting people onto medication is actually reduced recidivism by uh, up to 50%. Um, I, I'm just wondering kind of, you know, what your thoughts are about the opportunities and, I, and also the limitations, because I recognise that, it, you know, within the 27 days, it might just be all you can do is to, to stabilise someone with, a, with a, a substance misuse problem. But any thoughts or, or insights that you have in this direction would be very yeah, interesting. I, th I think whatever discussion we have in relation to remands is, is a discussion that that is appropriate for the entire custodial 
a population, because I think what you've, what you've introduced, Mr Johnson, is, is a question of why. You know, why is someone behaving in a particular way that you know, we and the courts find un unacceptable? And I think that's, that's really the route uh, towards um, working with, with people on a basis of greater understanding uh, to help them not only uh, avoid coming back into the justice system, but actually uh, to grow and lead fulfilling lives. Ultimately, that's, that's what we, we all want. Um, I think S SPS uh, has, in a, in a sense, got on this journey uh, somewhat later. Um, you know, Harry Burns uh, has helped us, as has many other, uh, and for many uh, other uh, academics. Um, we have learned quite recently about the effects and impacts of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, we learned recently, uh, when I say recently, the last few years, in terms of the effect of dyslexia. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and people that pass into our care uh, present multiple uh, deficits uh, and needs and complexities. And you know, that's, that's the challenge for the custodial organisation, the Scottish Prison Service, uh, is to try and find ways, working with partners, working with experts, to help to understand uh, the complexity, the totality of the individual and to work with them towards a more flourishing outcome. So what, what you've uh, highlighted there uh, in terms of ADHD is, is absolutely, um, uh, I think, a key uh, intervention for us helping to um, work with people more productively and more progressively in the future. So one of my key concerns in this area is that the evidence that we've seen about the, the, the lack of access to activities that, that people in remand have. You know, and, and, and I think that becomes particularly acute for, for anyone with, with, with either, um, uh, you know, ASD or, or, or ADHD. Uh, the, the fundamentally, the, the thought that, you know, putting someone with ADHD into a, a small room without any stimulation and expecting their behaviour to get better rather than worse, I think is uh, mildly absurd, if I can put it slightly, <laughs> in a slightly inflammatory way. So what can be done to improve access to activities for, for all prisoners in remand, but maybe also those particularly who, who benefit from doing practical things, which is definitely the case for people with, with, with uh, ADHD. I th again, I think as, as you've described, it's, it's an approach towards inclusiveness. Inclusiveness based on a better understanding of the individuals that, that we're caring for. Um, we, we, we are not a perfect organisation, we are not there yet, but we're learning. And I, I, I hope that the fact that we are uh, engaged in the research and building uh, a service response on, on the back of that is good indication to you in the community. This is, a, this is a prison service that's live to the issues. We understand, of course, the limitations and the challenges we face, but we are live to most of the issues and are trying to build and work on them. So just briefly, uh, and finally, can I just ask, so do you have active programmes to, to both uh, look at, at what improvements can be made and make recommendations for those improvements for, for, for the service as a whole, uh, both in terms of the sort of triage and, and also identification of, of underlying issues. And how yes, you and, and, and again, as you would you'd expect me to say, I think I think that's a continuum. Uh, so we're we're working on developing uh, the tool uh, to help us to understand where a particular uh, person is at and what their needs are. And then I think working with, with experts in the field, we will build a, a response to that. And if I may also say, uh, you know, in evidence that I gave earlier, the um, Prison Officer Professionalisation Programme and the training and, and the education package that goes along with that actually picks up on the very issues that you've just talked about. Thank you very much. Supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Yeah, thanks, Kavita. I was just, um, I mean, again, this may... Uh, require a response in relation to anecdotal evidence rather than uh, anything more concrete. The suggestion has been that uh, for someone remand pre-conviction um, there is uh, sometimes an unwillingness to engage with what support might be available um, in part perhaps through a belief that that's a, a tacit admission of guilt or, or whatever the reason may be. I mean to what extent is that a factor that whatever support may be available um, uh, that actually if there's, if there's an unwillingness to, to engage with that, 
support, there's probably a limited amount that um, prison service and partners are able to do. Is that, is that a problem of any kind of magnitude or is it, is it very peripheral and, and, and only applies to a very small number of individuals? From, you know, from my perspective, uh, I, I think it's really difficult to give you a, a direct answer to that. I think for some people that, that pass our way, um, it may be something of a career choice uh, that, that they've made uh, and see things in very short-term uh, bursts of, of activity and consequence. Uh, for others, um, it's, it's a consequence of history and uh, lifestyle and community. And all of those things influence one's preparedness or otherwise uh, to, to engage productively with, with the people uh, around them. My experience, however, recently uh, in the Scottish Prison Service with, with the assistance of a wide range of uh, partners now coming into the custodial space, I think we're managing to reach out and make contact with more of the people who live with us, even, even those who are living with us for a short period of time, than we've successfully done in the past. But I think that's because of our intention and, and our determination to do so. Does anybody else have any views on that? Not really something we've experienced. The, the nature of our service is people will make a referral when they have a specific need they need support for. So the people that don't engage, you know, we don't have any feedback on their reasons for, for not using the service, even if they do have a, a genuine need. And, and in terms of those kind of pre-conviction and post-conviction, what's the kind of balance in terms of who's, uh, who's kind of approaching you for, for support? Numbers-wise, we're about 20%. Of, of the referrals have been remanded, prisoners, the other 80% have been convicted, and of that, we're talking a majority of short-term yeah. sentences of the people we're working with. A lot of that's to do with awareness of the service, so as, as much as we've been in there three and a half years, it's still hard to get, you know, get the word out on the wing and get a lot of the people that need or would benefit from the service to be aware of. Um, so the, the short terms definitely, they seem to have a more urgent need for support I had a liberation. Right. Okay. Rona? Yeah, um, just wanted to clarify, um, Mr. McConnell, you may have um, answered this in uh, my colleague Daniel's um, questioning, and I might have missed it. Um, if someone comes into demand um, who clearly has addiction problems, that's identified early on, um, given that 27 days is a long time for someone with addiction problems, do they go on to a methadone programme? That would be a choice. Uh, a decision for, for the medics, but we, we, we know that national approach is, is to uh, provide um, uh, that medication. So, as I say, my expectation is if that's a requirement, yes, they would, mm -hmm. but I would be guided by, by the medics on, on whether that was appropriate or not. Okay, thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. It seems that we all accept that there are opportunities and possibilities to provide more support to prisoners on remand, uh, which could have favourable outcomes. Is it possible to identify any specific barriers to the provision of those solutions uh, to providing that support, do you think, at this stage? Um, I think for a number of people on remand in prisons, um, most of their support comes from visits from family members or from people who will be making the effort to sort of get up to prison to visit them. There isn't really very much else for them to do that. I think the difficulty then for is supporting the families to be able to do that. So if you are on remand, you can have um, visits six times a week. So six days out of seven, you can have that remand. For family members, that puts a lot of pressure on them to actually to be able to afford to go there, to put money into someone's um, personal cash account, um, to maybe take put things into their own... I was, I was at a local prison last week and a mum was standing beside me. She was trying to get a, a bundle of books in and she was told that she couldn't do that for, rightly so, for reasons of security because she didn't have two forms of ID. She'd taken two buses up. Her, her son, she said, was on remand and she was struggling to sort of get something over to him. So she had to take the books away um, to either post them in or to come back up at a later date um, on that two-bus journey to get the books into the prison. So, you know, there are 
there is the assisted prison visit scheme, which helps with visits to a, a, a prison, um, but that's only for two visits a month. And if people are on remand, then the visits can be, as we've said, taken up, up to six times a week. And that can be problematic for many families. So a wee bit more support in that way might be helpful for the families and thus given a little more support to the person on remand. Thank you. Um, I think barriers for, for individuals personally um, there can be barriers to accessing healthcare in terms of waiting lists or waiting times. So, you know, if there's an average waiting time of four or five weeks, um, and someone's on demand for, you know, twenty something days, they may not be able to to access the care or treatment they need. Um, for us as an organisation, it's awareness as well. So, you know, there's, there's obviously a high turnover of, of people on demand. So, it's trying to get the word out and and keep the awareness there with the prisoners. I think more broadly, for the third sector, it's, it's also about sustainable funding. I think quite often we hear of pilot projects that can have quite a big impact, but then there's no money for, for permanent funding. That's something that's common across the third sector. Um, so there is good work getting done. There might be you know, good outcomes for individuals, but that service is not there after you know, 18 months or two years. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on the barriers? Make, make the observation, uh, if I may, Mr. Kerr, that um, you remand, however uh, we, we, we seek to describe it, at the end of the day, it's sending someone to prison with all the, the barriers that go with that and all the rules and regulations. And whether, of course, there are some um, particular uh, respites to those uh, or easements of those rules and regulations because someone is not convicted. But for the most part, uh, someone sent on remand uh, experiences a full panoply of being sent to prison. Uh, so there are loads and loads and loads of barriers to actually providing someone uh, an accelerated, acute, personalised service in those circumstances. Can I just explore that? Uh, just coming at a slightly different angle, if I may. So we looked right at the start about data. Uh, and uh, Mr Clark there talked about awareness of what's going on. Do you have any idea, uh, and I appreciate I'm talking at a very general level, but whether the bulk of people being remanded are repeat remanders, if I can put it that way, or individuals, uh, and, and this might be the first or... Uh, second time and then they don't come back again uh, and if they are repeaters uh, do you have any idea of whether they are coming back and being remanded or refused bail for the same reasons each time because it rather seems to me that if we had that data then a specific intervention could be made on whatever the reason is for the refusal of bail does that make sense? It, you, you, your question makes absolute sense, and, and regrettably, you leave me in the embarrassing position of not, not being able to give you a, a comprehensive answer to it, because I simply don't know. Mm -hmm. um, my impression uh, would be that, for some, uh, this is a fairly well-trodden path, mm -hmm. and we would recognise uh, that locally. Uh, but in terms of answering your, your, your question specifically, I, I, I couldn't do that, because I don't have the data. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a concern that we've been picking up through the, through the committee sessions, just the point about data. Okay. Thanks, Camino. Liam McCarthy. <coughs> yeah, I, I just wonder, I mean, it would probably remiss of me as MSP for Orkney not to um, uh, pose the, 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 the specific question around implications of being on remand uh, for those who find themselves some way distant from from home and the support structures there. I mean, I, I suspect you will all have experience of this to some extent, but perhaps not to the um, to the extent of uh, of those in parts of the um, the country that John Finney and I represent. Are there other particular challenges there and, and things that can be done to try and minimise the the, um, the knock on impacts for those uh, affected, and I suppose to ensure that um, the, the the disconnection between those support structures. Um, uh, doesn't happen to an even greater extent, therefore making the reintroduction uh, post post uh, release um, is that a bit more difficult. If, if the, the committee would indulge me a, a sort of wry smile, um, I think you know, we've already uh, touched on the disconnection 
that, that occurs uh, through um, you know, being sent into custody. In this case, we're talking uh, about remands. And it seems to me to matter not whether you can get visits six or seven days a week, or in fact, twice a day, seven days a week. You know, the further that people have to travel and the more complex their arrangements, then you know, the more crazy actually that, that is. Um, but that can be the same you know, for people that are travelling through busy cities as, as it can be for people who just have longer journeys with, um, uh, with that in mind. So from my perspective, you know, I, I think there are possibilities uh, for us to explore increased use of uh, technology uh, to keep people in contact. Now, if the committee may, may remember, I'm trying to look around the, the committee members, I, I once suggested at this committee that we might even consider putting telephones in, in people's rooms, and I was excoriated in the press uh, for about 48 hours uh, thereafter. Some might say rightly so. Um, I, I, I don't, though. I still hold the view that we should try and keep people, their relatives, their families, those that are important to them, in contact with them, particularly, as we've heard from colleagues and friends uh, here, uh, during that period of what can be absolute trauma and bewilderment. So my, my um, concern would be to explore uh, the, the use of technology, uh, particularly in terms of uh, video uh, connection, video visits, uh, and we have some of uh, experience of making that, that work. But I appreciate in, in some quarters um, that that's a, a suggestion too far, but it's something I would like to do. I, picking up your point about phones and cells, I mean, I, I think I would have some sympathy with that, particularly in the context of, of um, the crackdown on mobile phones. It's far more difficult to um, provide any uh, reasonable uh, reason as to why a mobile phone might be present if indeed you've got um, uh, phones in, in cells that are subject to appropriate restrictions. I mean, as I understand it, the, the video conference facilities are limited to a, a fairly small number of, of prisons at the current time. Um, what are the rules around those on remand accessing those facilities? Because I, while I accept that there are difficulties in those crossing large busy cities, uh, I think the remedies for that are a lot more straightforward than they are if you come from um, Orkney or, or other parts of the, the, the Highlands and Islands and you find yourself even not necessarily in Inverness but, but further south still. Um, I mean, the, you know, this is 21st century Scotland and you know we're seeing um, uh, high-speed broadband cables being being laid everywhere. That's 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 great for for the community and great for the nation. Um, but I, I I think with that in mind, you know I I I, I think with um, potentially a more liberal view, and I, I use that deliberately. You know, I think there are real opportunities, as the committee has been considering here, uh, to keep people in contact because these are the very contacts that we hope will sustain people when they go back to the community, and if we break them, some of them are irrevocably uh, broken. Um, and I, I think, again, the trauma, the difficulties that people uh, experience in adjusting uh, to the custodial environment, and let me assure you, there are no um, hotel Hiltons in the Scottish prison service. So the difficulty that people experience in adjusting to that environment, I think, could be um, ameliorated to some point by keeping people in more regular and visual contact with our families and loved ones. Anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah, so. I absolutely certainly agree with that. And there has been a pilot in the past, actually, um, when some prisoners, people in prison, were sent down to um, Barlini from the north side of the country. And that worked really well. You know, so family members were going into a safe place, an office, in partnership with one of the other organisations, and being able to sort of have that contact with their family member in, in the prison environment. So it's, it doesn't sort of take the place of a good visit, but it certainly goes some way to actually m making sure that that family member is still in contact with their, his or her family. Yes, I think certainly over the years, the evidence we've heard, if there's contact um, ongoing with a significant other, it really does strengthen the resolve of the prisoner to, to continue with um, the, the behaviour that they've learned in prison as opposed to offending behaviour. And therefore, teleconferencing does make sense in so many different um, aspects, even for having to take prisoners to a, 
a location that's pretty far away, the time that takes from prison officers, takes them away from duties within the prison. It makes it makes sense in so many different um, levels. John, John Finney, and then I think we have to conclude. Thank you, Fina. It's just to follow up on that point, Mr McConnell, I do recall you, you, you making uh, that, that comment. I have to say, I for one thought it was highly appropriate and, and I thought the response in some quarters was completely ignorant. I just want to understand the, the politics, small p, behind that. Is that... Uh, dissuaded you from progressing that sort of idea because everything we hear suggests that it is contact of that nature mm -hmm. that not only makes things better for the individual but one would imagine collectively has a, a positive impact within the prison estate for, for you, you, your staff as well. Um, yeah, it, it is problematic. Uh, I, I think it's problematic uh, publicly and you will know better than I whether it would be problematic uh, in, in a parliamentary sense but certainly the Scottish Prison Service has not uh, as a matter of policy uh, pursued that, that idea. It remains uh, an idea, it remains um, an intention to do at, at some point. Uh, of course, there would be, uh, you know, there'd be resource uh, implications uh, in, in doing so, but also linked to that, if, without digressing, uh, convener, if you just uh, allow me this, this thought, uh, it also links through to what we do through our uh, education uh, provision. And I think there are opportunities there to, to further develop the, the education uh, provision in terms of the use of IT and, and, and connection uh, with, uh, with internet services and so on and so forth, where, the, where they are carefully governed through, through education authorities. So I think there's a direction of travel here which sort of reflects, I think, the, uh, the IT upscaling that the country in general is, is experiencing. And we must work very, very carefully to ensure that the prison environment is not is not uh, excluded uh, from that, and I think, as Mr. McArthur and yourself have just just pointed out, ma many of our citizens would actually benefit from doing that. It's very fine, that's a very small point. And that is uh, about any upgrades that have taken place on the street, in particular about new facilities that are coming on stream. Have they been future-proofed in such a way that the that would be capable of being put in place at some? That's time? certainly part of the specification. Right, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I should probably make clear that, that I was thinking of more of a video teleconferencing um, facility within the prison that could be accessed generally as opposed to something individually in cells, which I think may be problematic. Can I just ask you before we finish, does the National Prisoner Health Network, um, sh does it cover information sharing between agencies, Mr McConnell? It does. And is there anything that you could provide to the, the committee on the guidelines and, and what's set out there that we could actually look over to, to, to see if, if you could provide that? would be very much appreciated. Yeah, certainly, I can, I can write to the committee uh, on that. And, and I would I'd reinforce the, the point I made earlier that um, you know, the Scottish Government, as the committee will know, uh, has set up a um, Health uh, and Justice Collaboration Improvement uh, Board that's, that's chaired by, jointly by Paul Gray and uh, Paul Johnson. And that's a real engine room for driving connectivity uh, between health uh, and justice. And again, I think, I think there's some locus here in terms of what you've been talking about. Yes, that, that would be very helpful. As the evidence session today has been in teasing out some of the communications issues and some of the areas where more support is needed and that we, we need to highlight and address. So can I thank you all very much for attending. I now suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave on a five-minute comfort break.
Agenda item three is uh, further consideration of a negative instrument, Premises Licence Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 SSI, 2018 oblique 49. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. Members will recall that we previously considered this instru instrument at our meeting on the 6th of March and agreed to write to the Scottish Government for clarification in relation to the point raised on the instrument. Members have, uh, will have seen that the Cabinet Secretary for Justice um, responded and this response is um, included as part of Paper 3. Do members have any comments? I'm other than to say that the Cabinet Secretary yeah, did fine. clarify yeah. the, the point we raised. It's clarified. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, is the committee therefore agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? Agreed. agreed thank you. Agenda item four is subordinate legislation and consideration of six negative instruments. These are Sheriff Court Fees Order 2018, SSI 2018, Oblique 81. Sheriff Appeal Court Fees Order 2018, SSI 2018, Oblique 82. Sheriff uh, Court of Session, etc. Fees Order 2018, SSI 2018, Oblique 83. High Care Court of Judiciary Fees Order 2018, SSI 2018, Oblique 84. Justice of the Peace Court Fees Scotland Order 2018, SSI 2018, Oblique 85. And Adults with Incapacity. Public Guardians Fees Scotland Regulations 2018, SSI 2018, Oblique 86. I refer members to Paper 4, which is a note by the clerk, and ask members if they have any comments. Liam Kerr. He's, he's done it again, oh, Sorry, I've done it again, Liam <laughs> MacArthur. <laughs> I'm going to start wearing my name badge. Um, <laughs> it's it's not, nothing... Um, Overly substantive uh, convener. Uh, just reading through the um, uh, the explanation from from the government in relation to each of the uh, SIs at paragraph four. Um, there's a bit of detail around um, uh, some of the aspects of of the uh, the provisions that apply. I think in each instance, it then goes on in in paragraphs five and six to talk about the consultation, um, which is is fairly bold when you get to. Um, paragraph 6, where there was 22 responses were received and almost all stated their opposition to increasing court fees or the charging of court fees at all. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's effectively it. But if you take the, the, the trouble, as, um, as I did, as you'd expect, Convener, um, to then look at the, the details of the Scottish Government's uh, publications on the website, it, it then goes in to say, as a result of the consultation responses, um, there were a number of changes, enhancements to the means-tested uh, exemptions, special provisions for victims of domestic abuse, a reduction to the uh, permission to appeal fee. I, I think it would be helpful um, in, in setting out these sorts of um, uh, papers if the government were to actually make explicit what the changes were in broad terms on the back of the consultation, rather than including them in a fairly broad paragraph four um, where it seems to touch on them, but not make it explicit that the, that the changes are as a result of the consultation, and then go on to a consultation that, that, to the casual observer, just looks like a tick box exercise. Um, but I mean, other than that, I, I, I certainly. Um, I, I certainly take that point on, on yeah. the board as well. I thought 22 responses, no idea who they were and uh, exactly what was said, and yet it's clear they have been taken on board. So I think that would be very helpful. For to some extent, community. I mean, I think there'll probably still be those who are concerned about aspects sure. of it, but I, I think it would be in the government's interest, but in the interest of transparency uh, more generally, were they to, to make a more direct link between the consultation processes, the, the, the changes that were, were implemented. Mm -hmm. I think it would give you some reassurance yeah. that, that that wasn't, as I say, just an act academic exercise the government will go through. Absolutely, because some of the concerns have clearly been taken on board. Um, Daniel? Yes, so um, it follows very much on from what um, Ian MacArthur um, uh, pointed out. Um, but, and I've, so I've got two points of clarification that I would like to raise, but can I just start by making one generalised observation that the impact of this is, 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 qu is quite significant. Fees increased in, on average in 2016 by 24%, and this proposal will add 2.3% uh, this year and 2% next year. Now, I, I recognise the stated aim 
of the government that, that they want the court fees to more fully reflect the cost of the processes involved. But can I just make the, 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 the observation that that is a, a change in, in, in philosophy and that, that, that one point of view says the court service should be there as a, as a, a sort of civic institution and accessible to all, um, whereas this changes it to one that, that actually is one that, that you, you, you pay to access. So I'd make two points about this, um, or two points of clarification. It, it, either this um, is a, a policy decision to, to make sure that, that fees reflect the true court cost or it's about keeping it in line with inflation and I would just like the government just to clarify the nature of its increasing costs given that um, uh, payroll costs will be going up by about 1%. Um, I would guess that that's the largest uh, uh, part of its cost base. So can it just clarify why 2% is, is required? But moreover, I note from the equalities assessment that there are no particular uh, numbers involved. And I do note that there are a number of exemptions that are being put in place. But I would be interested to know what, what is the impact that the government has assessed in terms of people's ability um, uh, to uh, bring action to court and, and, and what uh, the increase in costs uh, might do to, to their ability to, to do that. Those are the points of clarification. And um, certainly there's a, a, a final equalities impact assessment was undertaken, as was a business and regulatory impact assessment. So perhaps some more detail is that... A, a because going into that, there, there doesn't appear to be you know, particular numbers um, cited in that, certainly not in my reading of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly um, in the past when there have been court increases, then... Um, the Faculty of Advocates or the Law Society of Scotland have, have not been in slow in, in sending in a separate submission to the committee if they were particularly concerned about it. But I think, again, it's a, a case of perhaps a little bit more detail on the impact assessment yes. might give the committee some more reassurance. Everyone happy with that? Okay, if that's the case, then um, are members or is the committee content that um, it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments other than the points that we've, we've raised just now. Just to clarify, that means because in the letter these instruments won't come back. No, it won't come back, but it's for future. Yeah, okay. So we'll send the letter and it's really for future um, when we're looking at any of these instruments. Thank you for that. Agenda item five is the Justice um, Committee on Policing and feedback from uh, the convener of the meeting of 15th of March 2018. Following this verbal report, report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions and I refer members to paper five, which is a note by the clerk and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Um, thank you, convener. As you likely say, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 15th of March uh, when it took evidence in Durham Constabulary's report on Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. The subcommittee took evidence from Deputy Chief Constable Rose Fitzpatrick, Duncan Campbell, Interim Head of Legal Services and Superintendent Andy McDowell, Professional Standards Department of Police Scotland. And this was to consider issues raised by Chief Constable Michael Barton during his evidence session in the previous meeting on the 22nd of February. It included Chief Constable Barton's concerns about Police Scotland changing the remit from an investigation to an inquiry, Peace Scotland's obstruction, as he saw it, and in particular the views of its legal department and that the risk-averse culture it had adopted had unnecessarily prolonged the process. Um, DCC Fitzpatrick explained that the legal advice she had received, which indicated that in accordance with the Police Service of Scotland Conduct Regulations 2014 to ensure impartiality, the person appointed to investigate complaints cannot be the same person to investigate any conduct issues which arise from these complaints. DCC Fitzpatrick assured the subcommittee that Police Scotland had taken on board the lessons learned during, uh, included in the Durham Constabulary's report. The subcommittee agreed it would review at a later date whether Police Scotland had implemented the 39 recommendations, uh, 39 recommendations within the HMICS independent assurance review of Police Scotland's counter-corruption unit. It also considered its forward work programme and agreed to next meet on the 19th of April to consider Police Scotland's review of custody provisions. And as you see, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I would um, add to that by saying it was a, a useful session, um, certainly from my perspective. I think we got an acknowledgement from DCC uh, Fitzpatrick that there had been um, a fairly 
um, fundamental uh, failing in the, the duty of care to the uh, four officers concerned in terms of the delays uh, in initially approaching them about what had happened um, and thereafter uh, throughout the course of the investigation. I think that duty of, contain, uh, duty of care maintains now and I would hope that Police Scotland will, um, uh, as I say, learn the lessons from what's happened um, and uh, do what is necessary in order to provide that support. I think also helpfully the, the session identified that whereas before we were told that the PSNI um, conduct report had led to um, no recommendations um, for, uh, for, for action to be taken. Um, DCC Fitzpatrick did acknowledge that in relation to retired officers, had they not been retired, um, there may well have been uh, recommendations there for um, uh, substantive uh, measures to be, to be taken. And, and I think that was a, um, an important um, distinction to be, to be made uh, from what was uh, originally revealed. I think the, the final comment I would make is that, well, I don't think necessarily there's more for the Policing Subcommittee to do it at this stage. I wasn't entirely convinced that, uh, from the evidence that we heard, um, that there is likely to be uh, a move away from the risk-averse, uh, overly leg legalistic approach that Police Scotland uh, took. The, uh, the representative from the legal department was at pains to say it was about being risk-aware rather than risk-averse. It doesn't suggest to me um, that there's been much of a, a, a willingness there to, um, uh, to, 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 to learn the lessons of, of, of what's happened and ensure that in future um, that there is perhaps a more cooperative approach um, uh, taken. Um, hopefully in, in, in the event that these events don't happen again. Um, but I, I, as I say, that would be my, my abiding concern. Uh, so is that a concern I would, I would certainly share. Um, while we had an assurance that lessons were learned, then the risk-averse culture had, it, uh, had been adopted unnecessarily, we were heard, and leading to a prolonged process and it was that prolonged process that affected things so badly so I think it's one that we would most certainly want to keep a watching brief on while there isn't anything to be done just now then to look very closely at um, how these uh, these legal decisions and advice is being taken and to safeguard against this so-called risk-averse culture. Is there no more questions on that Maurice Corey? I'm concerned in paragraph three, the statement about Police Scotland's obstruction. What are we talking about there? What, what, what do they mean by that, uh, Chair? Sorry, um, uh, John. Yeah, Sorry, through convener. yourself, Convener. It, it, it was felt, um, and the whole thing hinges around the interpretation of the, the conduct regulations, and the Chief Constable of Durham, um, I think... Um, my reading of it is this goes wrong from right from the beginning because there isn't clarity about what the task is that's being allocated. So perhaps understandably, he assumed it was the whole paraphernalia of investigation, where it was just to look at the complaint aspect and not the, um, the uh, aspect of conduct that may result from the complaint. So that was part of what was viewed by Mr. And I don't put words Mr. Barnsmith as, as uh, obstruction. Also the unwillingness to provide the names of retired officers. And the counter to that is, of course, we heard from the legal department is that you can't disengage data protection legislation in, in regard to that too. But I, I certainly would like to say it's extremely disappointing that the, the senior officer at, at the heart of this, who was less than helpful when they sat at the end of the table, didn't avail themselves to, the, to this inquiry. So that's where the word mm -hmm. destruction comes Thank from. Thank you. I think you know the, the telling thing was the information was provided, but it was provided in the first instance three months later, and then two months later, and we didn't get a satisfactory answer at the time of why that had happened. So very much a watching brief. I think, I think it's also worth saying, as, as, as John has indicated, that um, the, there are data protection rules around um, releasing details of, of retired officers um, so that contact could be made. Uh, I think what came out in the evidence session is a recognition that some of the preparation um, for inviting Durham Constabulary to undertake their investigation would, uh, one uh, would suppose, uh, be a, 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 an understanding about what would happen when that request came in uh, for access to those details, and that hadn't been done, which, as the convener said, further delayed the, the, the whole process. Okay, if there's no further questions, we'll now move on to uh, move into private session. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 27th of March, when we'll take further evidence on remand. And we now move into private ses uh, session. And I suspend briefly. No witnesses to go.